Good morning and welcome to Waymaker Fellowship this morning. Uh, to all who are present here, to those who are on Zoom and to those who have watched this on YouTube, I pray the Lord's blessing be upon you as you continue to grow in him. Our New Year theme is based out of John chapter 15, Abide in Me. And the focus this year is that we continue to deepen our relationship with the Lord, that we deepen those roots in him, that we may grow and bear fruit for him. And so this Sunday's message is coming out of Daniel chapter 3, verse 19 to 25, Daniel 3, 19 to 25. And it's the famous story of the three Hebrew lads who were thrown into the fire. And so you may ask real quick right now, well, if you're talking about abiding in me, why are you talking about being thrown in the fire? Well, abiding in me, that whole entire expression that Jesus teaches the disciples in the book of John was about teaching you and I that we live in him. Our life, our being, everything about us is in Christ. But sometimes in life, we're going to go through trials. And we need to know that in the midst of that trial, Jesus is with us. Not only are we abiding in him, he is abiding in us. And so throughout this year, I'm going to be bringing examples of where Jesus or the Father above in the Old Testament is abiding with his people or his children. So that we clearly understand by the end of the year, our responsibility to be in Christ, but also the recognition that the God that we love, the Lord that we serve, never abandons us, no matter how great the trial may be, no matter how difficult it may be. And that the only way for us to grow and deepen the roots of relationship with him is sometimes going through those trials that none of us like or want, sometimes going through those storms of life that no one wants or desires, but it is a part of humanity. And I remind you that every individual in this world goes through the difficult times of life. The difference between us and them is that we have a Savior that is always abiding with us. We have the fullness of Christ within us. That's what scripture says. So let's look at Daniel 3, and we'll talk about what's happening, and we will learn together what it means to have the fourth man in the fire. I want you to start at verse 16. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then those men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Father, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray that you would touch our hearts and for the many that will hear this. Father, I pray that if they are in the midst of a storm, 
if they're in the midst of a difficult time, circumstance, that they would remember that you are with them. Scriptures indicates you do not abandon your children. So help us be encouraged in the midst of all that we face in life, that as we abide in you, you abide in us. Bless this time, I pray in your son's name. Amen and amen. So let me give you a little bit of history. <clears throat> this is the time frame where the nation of Israel was in the 70 years captivity of Babylon. It's the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is gone. So if you go back in time, you had Solomon, last king of the United Kingdom. And then it divided between the northern and southern kingdom. Northern kingdom being 10 tribes, southern kingdom being two tribes. The northern kingdom had wicked kings, and they eventually fell by the Assyrians. The Assyrians came in and conquered them and took them away, and the ten tribes are no more. In fact, it's from those people come the Samaritans that you read about in the New Testament, particularly the women at the well, which I'll be preaching about next Sunday. And so the southern kingdom, which is Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes are the tribes that went to Babylon. The southern kingdom had a mixture of godly kings and ungodly kings and eventually ungodly kings to the place of where judgment came. And Babylon came in three times. They came in and they conquered and they took away the princes and the nobility and the basically the upper crust of society back. Jerusalem rebelled again, and they came back in, and they took all the merchant, middle class, those who owned a lot, into Babylon. Jerusalem rebelled again, and they came in, and they basically devastated Jerusalem, tore the walls down, tore the temple down, and left behind basically the people they didn't want. And so next Sunday's sermon, just to give you a little a prelude, is the woman at the well and the focus is going to be Jesus came to the people that nobody wants. You may have felt that way in life. I know I have. And so coming back to this message, the Jewish nation, Southern Kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, are now in Babylon. It's the book of Daniel. Daniel is one that was taken in. I'll be preaching about Daniel two weeks from now in the in lion's den. And so we have these young men who are brought in, and they are now in rulership. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are all in rulership. They rule parts of the empire of Babylon. They serve the king, Nebuchadnezzar. And the king, in his uh, pagan worship, in his arrogance and pride, and we find later on in Daniel, he is humbled by our God. He builds a golden idol. And he declares that whenever the music is played, everybody's got to bow down to this golden idol and worship this golden idol. Now, that's the setting. Now, you'll some of you may remember this setting because Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den for the same rationale. He bows to Jerusalem, to the temple to pray, and somebody rats him out. And so here we have these three young men. They're not Babylonians. They're of a conquered race, and they are in places of authority. And people get jealous, and they report to the king, hey, when the music is played, these three dudes won't get on their knees and bow to your golden idol that you built, and the king gets angry, Binds, brings them before him. In verse 16, they basically tell the king, hey, whatever God is with us, God will keep us in the fire, and even if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your gods. And I thought, yeah, what a great comment. And then the king gets really angry, as we read in the text, has a fire heated up seven times hotter than normal, and they're thrown into the fire. And the very soldiers that throw them into the fire die from the heat of that fire. And the great news is that final verse, 
when the king says, hey, wait a minute, didn't we throw three people into the fire? I see four, and they're walking around in the fire, and the fourth one looks like the son of the gods. And so I love this text because the many times in life that I have gone through traumatic events, circumstances beyond my belief, storms that were just unbelievable in my eyes and my heart, I have come back to this text with comfort to know that no matter how hot the fire gets, how difficult it may be, the fourth man is in the fire with me, and that fourth man is in the fire with you right now. And we need to remember that. And sometimes we forget. We're kind of like that little toddler, that little child that thunder goes and they jump out of bed screaming, Mommy, Daddy, where are you? And they're frightened because they think Mommy and Daddy are gone, but Mommy and Daddy are in the room. And we're like that in our life. And I want to encourage you today that not only do we abide in him, but he abides with us. And this text brings that to be true. And two weeks from now, when I preach on Daniel in the lion's den, even though he's not physically present in that lion's den, he is sovereign and in control of that lion's den where the lions did nothing. And we need to remember that our God loves you and I, that no matter what is going on in life, no matter how difficult it is, his love is so great, he never abandons his children, and he'll never abandon you. He's not fickle like humanity. He's not fickle like a church, sad to say. He is a God that loves you and I and will always stay with you and I. But we do need to learn that faith is only growing in the difficult times of life. It's easy to be a Christian when all is well. It's easy to walk with Christ when there's no opposition. It's easy to worship our God and raise our hands and proclaim his truths when there is no trial, no test. It becomes a little bit more difficult when we're walking on the water and we take our eyes off the Lord and we begin to sink. And by the way, that sermon is coming too down the road of Peter on the water. Peter doing the only thing that the other disciples didn't do. And we're going to talk about that in, in extent. So, you know, my whole focus this year is for you and I, particularly myself, as much as you, to be reminded and to learn that no matter what's going on in life, our responsibility, according to John 15, is to be in him. In him, we live and move and have our being. In him is our life. There is nothing outside of Christ. There is no job, no position, no title, no monies, no properties, no material item that is greater than Christ. Our life is Jesus. And when all is said and done, all that we have here will go away. And we will be with Christ for all of time. I know this is difficult. I know it's difficult to, to have that understanding within our emotions and our being, of him being with us when times are difficult, or particularly when, when we're on the waiting room of faith, when we're waiting upon the Lord to deliver, to open doors, to rescue, to bring relief, to break the famine. I know it's difficult when you're looking at your pocketbook and you're trying to figure out your bills, when you get the report from a doctor of, that your health or when family situations and circumstances take place and, and we can't see the answer. I know it's difficult in that waiting room of faith. Probably for Christians, that is the most difficult place to be. When God has spoken and now we're waiting. It's almost like we're on the sidelines, but really we're not. There is no second string when it comes to the kingdom of God. We're all in it. There's no second place. We all finish. So that ready room of faith, I know what it's like. Colleen and I, my beloved, we've been there for five years, five plus years, waiting on the Lord. And maybe this is the year. We sense it. We feel it. 
it's a trial, it's a test, but what are we going to do about it? What happens if it doesn't happen come December 30th of 2024? Will we still abide in him? Will we still be faithful to him? You see, beloved, living for Jesus is not about what we gain in the sense of the plus and minuses of life. It's about what we have already gained, which is eternal life. So there's a difference between a trial and a test. A test is that which God allows in our life to see if we remain faithful to him. Or are we going to go wander off and do our own thing? That's a test. A trial is that which we go through that brings glory to his name. But every, to everyone else around us, they're looking at us going, oh my. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. In February of 1862, President Lincoln's son really died. Many of us know that story. And his son, Ted, became seriously ill. A Christian nurse attending his child recalled the president watching by his bedside and pacing, saying, this is the hardest trial of my life. Why is it? Why is it? And how often have you and I said that? We've gone through difficult times. We've gone through times that our family and marriage and children and finances and jobs and health and just name it. And we say the same thing. This is a hard trial. Why is it? Why is it? And she shared with him that he, she was a riddle and that her husband and two children were in heaven. And she saw the hand of God in it all and never loved him so much as she did now after those great trials. And Lincoln asked her, how is it that that came about? And she replied, simply by trusting in God and knowing that he does all things well. And so he asked her the question, and I think it's the most important question. Did you submit fully after the first loss? And she replied, no. But as blow after blow came, I could and did submit. And Lincoln replied, I'm glad to hear you say that. I will try to go to God with my sorrows. After a few days, she asked him if he could trust God. And he replied, I think I can. I will try. I wish I had that childlike faith you speak of. I trust he will give it to me. Wow, what honesty. Here is a woman who lost her husband and two children. And in that day of the 1860s, that was a difficult time. And yet she trusted God. She saw the hand of God in the midst of those great blows. And Abraham Lincoln learned from her by her countenance, by her behavior, by her expression, by her words, that even in such a great trial, she remained faithful. And I love the answer that she said, no, I didn't submit fully. I don't think any of us can say we do the first time or the second time. But as we go through these trials, like the three young Hebrew lads, we come to learn that the fourth man in the fire is always with us. As we kneel down by our bedside, weeping before the Lord, he is there with us. As we're in that hospital room hearing the news, or we're there over a beloved family member, or a friend, or a child, he is there with us. As we're looking at our finances and we're wondering how we're going to pay the bills, he is there with us. Our God is with us. Not just because he's omnipresent everywhere, but because he's there relationally with us and he loves us with all of his being. So in the midst of that difficulty, in the midst of that struggle, in the midst of that time that we cannot even describe or put words into it, you need to know deep within your knowing that the God that loves you has not abandoned you. He's not forsaken you. He is not a fickle God. He is an immutable God that loves you entirely and a love that you will never fully understand. We must remember 
that he chooses to abide with us. Not because he has to, but because he wants to. You see, I think people are like potatoes. Here's a little trivia. Everybody knows Idaho is potato state. But did you know in, in the late 19th century, there's a small valley in New Hampshire that produced the most potatoes in the country? There's a little trivia. And did you know that Maine is a producer of potatoes, blueberries, lobsters, and trees? And so this story is about potatoes. You see, people are like potatoes. And potatoes, when they're harvested, they're sorted out by size to get the maximum dollar value. They're divided according to big, medium, and small. Some people are small potatoes, some people are medium potatoes, and some are big potatoes. It is only after the potatoes have been sorted in bag that they get loaded into the trucks or the wagons, whatever it was that they were using. And this is the method of all Maine potato farmers, except one. He never bothered to sort the potatoes. He just stuck them on the back of his wagon, just threw them all back. So he would have a wagon full of potatoes of all sizes. And then he would find the most difficult road to travel. I want you to key on that. The most difficult road to travel. As he traveled that difficult road, and the wagon is bouncing everywhere, he declared this. Because somebody asked him, how in the world are you getting the most money? You don't even sort them. And he says this. It's simple. I just load up the wagon with potatoes, take the most difficult, roughest road to town. During the eight-mile trip, the little potatoes always fall to the bottom. The medium potatoes are always in the middle. And the big potatoes always rise to the top. It's not only true of potatoes, it's true of life. Big potatoes always rise to the top because of difficult times. Your faith grows through the difficult times. So if you're wondering why every little nuance bothers your faith, it might be that you're just a small potato. It may be that you haven't gone through the difficult things of life. It may be that you're avoiding them. It may be that you're running from them. Maybe you're looking for grass on the other side of the fence and screen them. Never is. Maybe what we need to do is dig our roots down, no matter how difficult it may be, and find that we are a big potato. Let's be a big potato, not a small potato. And we know this to be true because of the text that I'm using. If you look at verse 17, they have confidence in the power of God. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. When you have confidence in God, you can walk through anything. You have that confidence because you know he's there with you. You cannot have that confidence if you don't know him. You cannot have that confidence if you don't know his personage, his character, his nature, that he's immutable. He is Hatisar in the Hebrew, the rock that never changes. That's always there. You see, they knew God. So when the proclamation came out, hey, if you don't do this, you're going to burn. They didn't care. What would you and I do right now if the United States government, which is the country I'm in, for those who are not in this country listening, said you can no longer worship your God. You must bow to a golden idol. How many of you would do that? Well, if you do that, it's because you don't know the God that you worship. I know that's a tough statement. Because if you know him, you know he'll keep you. You know that. Trust only comes from knowing. Trust only comes from knowing. As you know him, you will trust him. We know that to be true. But people, God has already promised to establish a kingdom that will never be destroyed. No one can take away what God is doing in your life. No one can change God's plan in your life. No one can take away, destroy, do anything that God has spoken about you. Because God is sovereign. 
over the heavens and the earth. And mankind is not sovereign. And governments are not sovereign. God can overthrow governments anytime he wants to. God can bring healing to your body anytime he wants to. God can deliver you anytime he wants to. God can open up the banks anytime he wants to. God can bring whatever your need is anytime he wants you. Do not look to man. Look to God. Better yet, look to the Savior who loved you so much he died for you. That's love. And he'll keep you in the mess. Number two, they were completely submissive. Oh, my goodness. Did you use that submissive word? I did. Oh, how could you use that? Well, it's biblical. I know I'm not going to why well, submit the husbands and all that right now. Okay, that, that'll be a sermon some other day. They were submissive to the will of the Father. They were submissive. In other words, he was Lord. I spoke about this last Sunday, that we really don't understand what that means. We run around telling people, Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah, praise God. But we really don't have that buy-in to understand. When we use that word, then what we're really declaring is, he can do whatever he wants. And if there's any weakness, I believe, to the church in my country, the American church, is that we are an independent, rebellious little group of people. Well, kind of be funny, we're no different than the nation of Israel that went into captivity. Independent and rebellious. We speak a good walk, but we do not necessarily walk a good walk. We worship a God that we love when it's convenient and when it goes the way we want. We will submit to God if it's to our gain. But true relationship with the Father above is a true submission to all things of the Father above. They were truly submissive, completely submissive. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the goat image which you have set up. Amen and amen and amen. Hey, beloved, listen, the world is looking for the real thing. They're looking for the true Christian, the true believer, who is not compromised in their integrity, who is not settled in for second best, who is not set there and said, God is my God on Sundays or Saturdays. But God is our God all the time. They want to see the real thing. And you may get ridiculed and you may get harassed and discriminated against in your workplace or in your community. But God is a great God. Hey, listen. We, John Ford, the woman at the well, she went back. She was not a popular person in that community. She was despised. And she went back and shared the good news. And that entire village got saved. Don't limit what God can do. Choose this day whom you will serve. Okay? They did. And when, when they did that, they got thrown into a fire. They did not fight it. They did not resist it. They were bound up and thrown in the fire. Job says this, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though who slay him? God, yet will I trust him. Trust who? God. Though God slay me, I will trust God. And that should be our mindset. Okay. Paul says it, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. We are all going to die one day. As I've said many times, the moment we're born, we are dying. That is a medical fact, as well as just simply a truth. Okay? Well, notice that these three men, this is important, did not consider being thrown into the fire as a failure to their God. Think about that. Read Hebrews 11, the great chapter of faith. 
read how they lived and died, but never saw the promise. We need to be people of God that know that our God is right here. I know that at this moment that I am proclaiming God's truth, the God I love, the Lord that I love, is right here with me. One on one side, one on the other side. And I know the Holy Spirit is with me. I am with the Trinity of the Almighty right now. Here, here, and with me. I mean, you can't get better than that. With me. When I'm in that emergency department, they're with me. They don't abandon me. They don't leave me. They don't ignore me. They're not fickle. They are faithful. Okay? And I need to remind you, write this down somewhere. Tattoo it. No, don't tattoo it. Put it somewhere. That when God allows you and I to go through the fire, he always has his eye on the clock and on the thermostat. When we go through that fire, God's watching the clock and the thermostat. He is absolutely, totally in control, and he is always in control. Look at the response of Nebuchadnezzar. He's angry, carnal. Have we been around people like that? Sure we have. Have we been about, around church people like that? Oh, sad to say, yes. He orders the furnace heated seven times hotter. So hot, it kills his soldiers. Mighty soldiers, not just wimpy ones, but mighty ones. I mean, think about it. The whole scene just shows the absolute power of mankind. The king's in control. He's angry. Heat that fire up seven times hotter. Throw them in. With no regard to the soldiers. He doesn't even get, shed a tear that his soldiers die. Nothing is said. He's sitting there gleefully waiting for the three to be thrown in. <laughs> I got him good. Oh, hey, by the way, king, you just lost, you know, I don't know, six to eight soldiers. Uh, who cares? What arrogance and lack of regard of human life. But look what happens. There's a fourth man. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. There's a fourth man. And the three that were thrown in are walking around in the fire. Now, yesterday I treated a patient who burned his foot. And um, very painful. Last week I, I treated a patient that uh, burned his upper thighs and, and abdomen area uh, cooking. And um, extremely painful. I mean, I, I've been burned uh, at times, you know, touching something that was hot, and man, does it hurt. I can't imagine being in the middle of a fire. But these three guys are walking around in the fire having a good time. They're worshiping. Hmm. Again, be noted that when you're going through the fire, when you're going through that difficult time, God is watching the clock in the thermostat. He knows where you're at. Okay? Isaiah says this. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Wow. That's Isaiah 43. What does it say again? When you walk through the fire, it shall not be burned, nor shall, nor shall the flames scorch you, for I am the Lord your God. What does it say again? When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord, your God. Who can trump God? No one. No entity, no government, no company, no nothing. Humanity cannot. Earth cannot. Aliens cannot, if you believe in that. Nothing can trump God. He holds the universe in one hand. The entire universe, all the black holes and everything else. 
and you. Nothing can trump the God that loves you. So why do we fret? Why do we fear? Because we've forgotten he's with us. How many of you as parents remember the first thunderstorm that happened and you're in bed asleep and all of a sudden you have a child with you or better yet your dog. I remember a lady, my German short haired pointer who I loved with all my heart. She was downstairs, didn't come up to go to bed, sleeping on the couch on her blanket. And a thunderstorm happened. And in Maine, they happen quite often. Here they don't. And every time we get rain, my beloved is up. Doesn't matter what time. She's staring out the window watching the raindrops fall. And she's like, honey, honey, get up, get up. Good. It's raining. And I'm like, I'm from Maine. We know what rain is. It happens all the time every year. And it's like living in the midsection of the country. A thunderstorm happens on a weekly basis. So I'm up and I'm in bed. It's raining and it thunders. And the next thing you know, I have a dog burying herself under my blankets. Cutest thing in the world. Whimpering and crying like, Dad, where are you? It doesn't matter what breed of dog. They generally don't like it and they come running. It's just like a little child. All of a sudden, you got all your kids in bed. Some of you are laughing right now because you're remembering those moments. Well, what happened? They forgot that we were there. And sometimes we're not like that with God. If you could imagine God being in bed asleep, all of a sudden things happen and we're running, trying to get to God. And God is laughing and, and chuckling because he's with us anyways. God is always with us, always with us, day and night. God does not slumber, nor does he sleep. He is faithful to be faithful, to be faithful, to be faithful. And we can place our hope and our trust in him, no matter what it is that we go through, because he abides with us. All right. So point number four. Here we go. Last point. Look, he answers. I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is the Son of God. I just wish I was there. Because I could guarantee you those three guys are having a worship time with the Lord. They are The Lord that they worship is there with them in the midst of that fire. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine being in the waiting room? Can you imagine being in a difficult place and God himself is right there working with you, talking with you? Well, he does that because he loves you. What is our takeaways? Trials will strengthen your faith. You want to be a big potato? Go through the trial. Stop running from them. Two, God will keep you by his power. Not by your knowledge, not by your understanding, but by his power. Three, we should not be as surprised when we encounter such trials. On contrary, we should expect them because we belong to Christ, for they are character developments. And some of you are going to tell me right now, I have enough character. I know, I've said it to God many times, going through a trial. God, I have enough character. I don't need any more character. I have a bunch of characters in my church. Why do I need more character? And God will chuckle with me and says, you're going to go through the trial. And I go, okay. The famine, the feast, the difficult times, the hard times. It just develops character. And I worship with the God that abides with us. Is that not what we really want? Hmm. Many people are always trying to find a way to get around the fire. And in doing so, you never grow. You're stunted. He abides with you. Relax. Be at peace. If God wants to go bungee cord jumping with you, go do it. If God wants to do something with you that's radical, go do it. He's with you, as long as it's God. So to give you an example of what I'm going to say. You can either look at every trial as, thank you, Lord, for being with me in the midst of all of this. I will worship you in the midst, like the three young Hebrew lads, knowing he's with them. Or you can do the doom and gloom. Woe unto me. 
doom, despair, agony on me, you know, that famous song. You can see the hand of God, or you can cry because you don't see the hand of God. In 1910, there's a little insect called the boll weevil. The boll weevil wiped out the cotton uh, crop in the South, the entire cotton crop, forcing Southern farmers to di diversify by planting peanuts, uh, other new crops. It brought great change. You see, you can either sit there when God changes something and bemoan it, or you can see the hand of God to bring change that brings prosperity and growth. It's your choice. You see, we are like everybody else. We don't like change. We get into a rut of life, a rut of worship, a rut of walk with God. And a rut is nothing more to me than an open-ended grave. Get out of the rut, let God change, let the trial change you, that you may have prosperity and growth in your life. Who knows what God can do? Make a choice. Because in the midst of the fire, the fourth man is always there. Well, what was the secret of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They trusted God's promise never to leave them, nor forsake them, and not to be forgotten. They feared and loved their God. Hmm. In closing, I want to share a little concept with you. I want to remind you that there's a purpose to every junction of life where you're being tested in a trial. Let me give an example. A $5 bar of steel cut into ordinary horseshoes is worth $10. A $5 bar of steel cut into needles is worth $350. The same bar of steel cut into springs for watches is worth $250,000. The same bar of steel can be worth $10, $350, or $250,000. It's all about what the purpose is and what you allow done. So next time you get discouraged at what God is putting you through, think of the bar of steel. Do you want to be a $10 person? Do you want to be a $250 person? Or you want to be a $250,000 person? Same bar of steel but its purpose and use changes its value. What is God wanting to do with you today? What trial are you going through today that no one knows about but you and God, not even your loved one? What is going through your mind right now? What are you saying when you read this passage? Whew, I'm glad it was them. Or are you saying, God, Use me because I trust you, because I know you. I remind you, in human relationships, we trust people as we know them. Do you trust the God who made the heavens and the earth to keep you in the midst of that trial, to abide with you at all times? Or are you looking to be the small potato or the low cost? For still. I pray that in your heart today, you will recognize that God loves you and abides with you because he loves you. May God's peace and blessings be with you.